innovativ. Holistik. Ästhetik. Free thinking. Chaotisch. Honest. Revolutionary. Weiß. White. Radikal. Fast. Deutsch. German. Das That ist Bauhaus. Is Bauhaus. After 100 years, the ideals of the Bauhaus are more relevant today than they were then. Das Bauhaus hat ja vor 100, 100 years ago, Bauhaus reimagined the future. How will we learn? How will we live? The Bauhaus influence is everywhere. Bauhaus set out to formulate a language of design that was universal. That everything has an ideal height, an ideal size, and that's what optimizes its utility. You know, they, they want to kind of bridge the gap from whether you're a craftsman or whether you're a designer or whether, whether you're an artist. Bauhaus is a legend. The brilliance of the Bauhaus school remains undiminished even today. Even though its existence was short-lived, it continues to shape the world we live in. New approaches to education and training, architecture, painting, dance and design were explored and developed here. When Hitler seized power and forced the school to shut down, its artists, architects and visionaries emigrated, fanning out and spreading the Bauhaus doctrine around the world. So what exactly lies behind the enduring appeal of Bauhaus? A British furniture designer with Nigerian roots, Yinka Ilori lives in London. His fascination with chairs places him firmly in the Bauhaus tradition. He trawls the city in search of inspiration. I'm always on the bus, on the top deck of the bus, by the window. In London, there's always, there's always chairs everywhere. You know, I might look up there and I put a chair there or, I don't know, yeah. So I'm just always looking around and always, you know, inquisitive to kind of see what's around. You know, and, and what I find, so, yeah, you never know, you never know. That's the, that's the beauty of what I do. Yinka doesn't find anything that strikes his fancy on the street. So he tries his luck in a charity shop. Bamboo, this is quite nice as well, actually. This is quite cool. You know, the first process is, is sort of looking, looking, seeing the chair. Um, and then second would be kind of having the parable in my head, so having the, the narrative of the chair. This chair, this chair is it's definitely like 1940s, 50s. It's really, it's quite an old chair, isn't it? It's not, it's not, it's not a... It's not modern. No, exactly, yeah, so it's no, definitely it's probably, 50s, it's 60s, isn't it? 50s, yeah. yeah. Yinka is drawn to pieces that have a story to tell. He likes to work intuitively. So I like pieces with character. So this is this has got a lot of character. So it's in, you know, kind of also, you know, I like the way they've kind of used different materials. So definitely have some ideas on color palettes because that sort of speaks to me. Because what I do is, that, you know, I look at each kind of section. So I'm kind of thinking of a lion in, you know, in the in, in the jungles so maybe, or in or in the wilds. It could be a lion in, you know, maybe this could be green. I don't know. But I'm just I'm just thinking of the context of where I would see, you know, these you know these 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 feet, these lion feet. Um, and also, this kind of reminds me of a, mu a musical instrument, like a guitar or something. I don't know. Intuitive design. That was a bedrock principle of the Bauhaus. The art school in Weimar, Germany, was founded in 1919 by architect Walter Gropius. He was joined there by many of the most venerated artists of the time. After the ordeal of the First World War, they were eager to remake the world from the ground up. This called for a new breed of industrial designer, Gropius believed, and new forms of training. A foundation course was compulsory for all students. It taught basic techniques of art and craftsmanship. 
It was developed by Swiss painter Johannes Itten. He encouraged students to work intuitively and experiment with forms, colors, and materials. The characteristic colors and forms of the Bauhaus influenced artists such as Paul Klee and Vasily Kandinsky. The primary colors red, yellow and blue and the geometrical forms of the square, triangle and circle have become the trademark of the Bauhaus. There's an abundance of form and colour in Yinka Ilori's studio in London. Well, I studied product design and furniture at university, so I have a degree in furniture making and in product design. You kind of teach yourself a lot of the processes as you go along, and it was more theoretical. So lots of like, art history, looking at Bauhaus, looking at art history, art, art of design, art of um, photography. There wasn't a lot of making, which was a shame. Carpentry, set design and ceramics workshops formed the cornerstone of practical training at the Bauhaus School. That would have been right up Yinka's street. Each chair tells part of his own story. I actually understood why my parents loved Nigeria and what it meant to be African and be a black British, you know, in London and how powerful that was and how, you know, I, 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 I felt like I, I had power because, you know, not everyone is black, is, is Nigerian, is British. So what I wanted to do was retell my narrative using Nigerian parables. Yeah, these sort of thing, yeah. There was an interesting story here. Yeah, I recently found out that uh, the University of Ife was actually designed by an Israeli architect um, who also studied at the um, Bauhaus School. Um, and I think for me, it's one of the best discoveries I've ever seen, actually, because it was just mind blowing. And just seeing, I don't know, just, just not knowing that Bauhaus actually existed in Nigeria, I think. Even just thinking about it makes me smile, makes me happy. And um, if you look at my Instagram, when I posted this image of, you know, of these three images, people were just fascinated. The University of Ife campus in Nigeria was designed in the 1960s by Bauhaus graduate Aria Sharon. Africa has both shaped and been shaped by Bauhaus. For sure, if I look at this chair, I can, it, it looks like an African chair. There's definitely influences from Africa in this piece here. This is indeed the African Chair, a collaborative effort by two Bauhaus masters, designer Marcel Breuer and textile artist Gunther Stolzel. There you go. So it's called the Africa Chair and it's definitely, yeah. I mean, without even knowing, I love Marcel Breuer as well. And I think I have a copy in, of this chair in my studio. I don't know if it's a copy, it could be real, you know, it's actually, you know, I bought it from a charity shop. Um, in, in, in Chiswick. Let's have a look. Ooh, just, I mean, I like this. I'm not really sure, the sort of hand woven texture here is amazing as well. This kind of bamboo is, is really nice. It's just a really clean design, yeah. Yeah, I love it. It was in 1925, once the school relocated to Dessau, that Bauhaus started to become more widely known. From his glass-fronted office, Walter Gropius overlooked the school premises. Nothing escaped him, including all the student goings-on in the workshop next door. The students are now long gone. Today, Claudia Perrin is the director of the Bauhaus Dessau Foundation. Bauhaus was pretty crazy, it has to be said. When you look at the Bauhaus building, you can see how radical it was. And then there were all these girls with short hair working together with boys, all very casual. It was quite a provocation. I think it was very provocative. The Bauhaus sought to create an impression of transparency, of airy, radiant space. 
Gropius was very aware that a new era had dawned and that a new era called for new forms and new solutions for living. He saw this reflected in every aspect of industry, but not really in architecture. The new clear language of forms was put into practice in the nearby masters' houses. Walter Gropius designed these homes for the Bauhaus teachers and their families. Construction began in 1925. The homes of Walter Gropius and Laszlo Mohoy Nodge were destroyed in the Second World War. In 2014, they were rebuilt, but not so much reconstructed as reinterpreted. Artist Olaf Nikolai designed the interior of the Mohoy Nodge house. As an artist, Mohoy Nodge was very interested in light. So I made light a central part of my design and figured out a way to make it an element of a visitor's experience. And one way to draw attention to light is to refract it. I made the surface of the artifact, the building, my playing field. I wanted to work with what was already there. I also wanted to bring out the craftsmanship that played such a key role at the Bauhaus. Plastering walls is a very simple artisanal activity, so I decided on four types of plaster, white powdered marble with various grain sizes. The variations in granularity and the way that light strikes the walls create shadow plays. The house is crying out to be photographed. There is no one Bauhaus. It was very diverse. There was a bit of everything. It had Paul Klee, it had Oskar Schlemmer, Hannes Meyer, who had a staunchly socialist agenda, Mies van der Rohe, who wanted nothing to do with ideology and was on a quest for pure form. It had people who introduced compulsory yoga classes. What's truly fascinating is, of course, what happens when a design movement becomes a universal concept, when it becomes life. In Japan, quality design traditionally plays a big part in daily life. The aesthetic sensibility and the striving for clarity and simplicity underpinning Japanese culture have much in common with the visual language of Bauhaus, and indeed partly inspired it. Greater Tokyo is one of the world's largest metropolitan areas. Housing is expensive and in short supply. Mio Tsuneyama belongs to a young generation of Japanese architects interested in new housing concepts. You can't never see inside of the houses and also um, very close to relation, isolated situation. They never invite the people and friends or even family. They don't know each other the next each other, I think. Mio is seeking an entirely new approach. OK, I have to change my mind on the architect, like how to read uh, the city, asking a uh, different way of living in Tokyo. So I proposed a completely different way from normal one-room apartment in Tokyo. The Hayashi family's housing solution is radical by Japanese standards. The project was started by Kanei Hayashi's wife, Chie, before the couple got married. Her house was very small, studio type. 20, uh, 20 square meter, square. everything packed. Toilet, shower, kitchen, bedroom, everything was not separated. So she was living like that, as many other Japanese people do. But then, uh, uh, she, she likes cooking and uh, she wants to relax in the sofa to watch TV, something like that. But she cannot do that. 
So when we find this one, we have uh, plenty places to do that. But you know, it's too big for her alone. So maybe we wanted to do some share house. A shared house for people who aren't necessarily all family and who are willing to redefine their relationships to one another. <laughs> Mio is converting the old house into a house for seven people. A home like this would be unaffordable for a family. Yeah, it's kind of a reaction of the like, economy and the society uh, situation that the economy went down and people doesn't have a lot of job. So um, young people doesn't have, like, in a way, as a good life as their parents. They started to do something. Mio took meticulous measurements so as to use the space as efficiently as possible. The small bedrooms on the upper floor are separated by a light and airy hallway, a bridge between the private and the shared spaces. Using the steps, like we could sit down here and put the things so the life of the individual rooms extend here. The rooms are small, while the shared areas are spacious. The multi-purpose living room is where residents and friends can come together. In a city that's becoming increasingly anonymous, the house is a small pocket of community. Mio and her husband run a successful architecture firm. She's a big fan of German Bauhaus. Miss van der Lohe is the most inspiring uh, architect from my like, student time. And from his materiality and proportion, and also he makes it very simple and it looks very easy, but it's not. And his like, relationship with us outside and room and room and the furniture, it's related all together, and this is kind of magic. Bauhaus had close ties to Japan from the outset. This house was built in the 1930s by Iwao Yamawaki, who studied at the Bauhaus school. In 1954, Walter Gropius visited the brand new Kuwasawa Design School in Tokyo, writing in the guest book, here I have found genuine Bauhaus spirit. In her work, Mio often refers to this weighty manual, compiled by Ernst Neufert, another Bauhaus graduate. The first edition of his architect's data is in Weimar. The current edition of this international bestseller was updated by architect Johannes Kister. As soon as you start planning a new project, you reach for your Neufert. It's currently in its 42nd edition, and it's published all over the world. It's a reference book for spatial requirements in building design and site planning, from the best height for a door handle to the angle of a body leaning back in a chair. To compile these norms, Neufert carried out detailed measurements of the human body in daily activities and its use of space. The Bauhaus wasn't the first to measure daily life. But the radical approach of relating architecture, space and spatial relationships to such measurements, and the radical extrapolation of space allocation and typology from these relationships, that was the cornerstone of Bauhaus. The book was finally published three years after the Bauhaus was shut down by the Nazis. But the efficiency of Neufert's manual suited the totalitarian system, and the Nazis co-opted it for their own purposes. After the war, when its merits could once again speak for themselves, it became a bestseller. Nowadays, Neufert's manual can be found in architecture firms all over the world. 
What space is needed for an elevator? How much space do you need in a kitchen, an industrial kitchen, a canteen? What size should something be to work well in its environment? It's just useful, right? Because when we want to uh, know the like example of this uh, certain typology, if you flip this book, we can find very basic uh, measurement. The knowledge we have to know, but we can't put everything into my our brain. So it's somehow a part of our brain, right? <laughs> Measuring people, activities, things. Rationality and detail as tools for optimizing daily life and use of space. Hallmarks of the Bauhaus code that carried as far as Japan. The Bauhaus archive in Berlin, designed by none other than Bauhaus founder Walter Gropius himself. Director Annemarie Jägi is the guardian of his legacy. It wasn't the ordinary, old-school craftsperson training. The aim was to train a new type of artist, the industrial designer who could wear all hats, a generalist who could be an architect or a typographer, a painter, a sculptor, a photographer, an industrial designer who represented the universal. The manifesto of the Weimar State Bauhaus was published in April 1919. Architects, sculptors, painters, we must all turn to the crafts. Together let us conceive and create the new building of the future. What they wanted to avoid was a drifting apart. Art on one side, art for art's sake, salon art. And on the other side, the more downmarket applied art that is craft. The Bauhaus Code blurred the distinction between fine art and applied art. Then and now, the starting point is always the material. That's about 25% each of feldspar and quartz, and 50% kaolin. Amazing how this dust can turn into something with so much bulk. And somehow elastic, too. Imagine it being poured or molded. Its texture is so great. Berlin-based design collective New Tendency is in demand. The team are graduates of the Bauhaus University in Weimar. They design industrial products for everyday use, in the Bauhaus tradition, functional and no frills. The firm is teaming up with one of Germany's oldest manufacturing companies, the Royal Porcelain Factory, KPM. It supplied Prussian kings with Berlin porcelain. Why do we mainly manufacture in Germany? On the one hand, because of the tradition of craftsmanship, but also because of the convenience, the fact that we can visit the factories. That's very exciting for us designers. It reminds us of the craftsmanship involved and broadens our minds. The KPM's porcelain is all handcrafted. Ceramicists at the Bauhaus in Weimar began designing simple, modern porcelain tableware for the KPM in 1929. New Tendency is marking the 100th anniversary of Bauhaus by collaborating with the KPM on a commemorative plate. As soon as you start, it's already gone. You can see how fast it's turning. It's a question of seconds. Today, the team are presenting their ideas to the KPM's head designer. When you look at it from the front, there's a lovely play of light and shadow. 
The industrial and constructivist aspect is a great contrast to the delicate porcelain. We found that contrast very intriguing. It reminds me of Bauhaus photography, the light and shadow and negative space. We explore these elements with our designs too. New Tendency designs practical, high-quality products. They're not interested in mass production. But their kind of craftsmanship has a price, one that not everyone can afford. Business, though, is thriving. We're completely international. We get a lot of inquiries from the US and England, but also South Korea and Japan from people with a similar sense of aesthetics. In keeping with the Bauhaus spirit, a good product is a fusion of skilled craftsmanship and artistic vision. An essential part of the Bauhaus appeal is that Gropius was keen on the idea of synergy. A vision that's become reality. Boundaries between creative disciplines are increasingly blurred. First, I need a vacuum. The material softens and starts to melt. It melts very fast and then it gets smooth. Finished. The results are unexpected. Is Kasia Kuhaska conducting research for the car industry? No, she's preparing for her graduation show. She studies fashion design in Berlin. My basic idea was to see if I could produce a collection without actually sewing anything and instead use different production methods. So I worked a lot with lasers and glue to explore the alternatives, to see how I could make clothes production more modern. I wanted to replace man-made with machine-made. I have a background in architecture. Perhaps that's why I tend to focus more on production methods used in industry and industrial design. The very ideological Bauhaus principle is always my starting point when I begin a new project. The principle of function first. And also standardization, the idea that everything has an ideal height, an ideal size, in order to optimize its utility. I'm really intrigued by the idea that rather than simply buying an item of clothing, you could buy CAD or computer-aided design data. You get your data, go to a workstation, and a machine makes the clothes for you. This design is based on motorbike trousers, made from an upholstery fabric commonly used in the car industry. But isn't there such a thing as excessive optimization? I wanted to apply an overcomplicated process of supposed optimization to clothing. It's a humorous comment on this trend. It's not meant to be taken seriously. The big event, the catwalk show in the evening. Last minute pitfalls are inevitable. Will the trousers fit? <laughs> no, 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 but you have to put your uh, legs together. <laughs> what do you think? Like, can you walk all the three? Yeah, I guess. I mean, it would be nice to just try a longer distance. Awesome. Just then, let's do that. I 
I have to wait, they're taking a photo. Is it your turn? Then go. Cash's collection is about to make its catwalk debut. After months of hard work, her graduation in her pocket, she can finally relax and enjoy the moment. Fashion design that straddles architecture and technology, analogue and digital. A cross-disciplinary approach is quintessentially Bauhaus. One of the main reasons for the success of Bauhaus was that the movement was brave enough to bring together very different creative minds. When you take a look at who taught there, they don't seem to have anything in common creatively. And they were very different characters. But I think that Gropius realized that only diversity could produce answers to the questions raised by the new era. This architectural icon in Spain is a perfect distillation of that collaborative spirit, the reconstructed Barcelona Pavilion, originally designed for the 1929 International Exposition by Mies van der Rohe, the third director of the Bauhaus School. The architecture and the interior blend seamlessly. The furnishings, which include the famous Barcelona chair, were co-designed by Mies van der Rohe and Bauhaus master Lili Reich. The creative scope of the Bauhaus school was unique. A printing and advertising workshop opened in Dessau in 1925. The workshop's head was Herbert Bayer, who designed the new typefaces that would help define the Bauhaus style. He was a pioneer of what we'd now call corporate design. When Amman, the capital of Jordan, decided it needed its own branding, it hired graphic designer Jan Garner, who specializes in typefaces. It was a pretty daunting task. I first came to Amman in 2004 as a young student, and then I came back in 2008 to develop a typeface for Amman, an Arabic and Latin type design for the greater Amman municipality. It was my graphic design graduation project at the Bauhaus University in Weimar. Amman is one of the first typefaces that bridges the gap between Western and Arab fonts, designed by a Bauhaus graduate. These days you'll see Amman typeface on every street sign, on public transport, on public websites and official printed material. I was very fortunate to be able to help define the urban landscape, the visual identity of this city. The Middle Eastern city is also home to some intriguing modernist architecture, albeit a little hidden away and, more often than not, somewhat weathered. Whereas the Amman font on this cultural centre is impossible to overlook. I was happy to see it in such a prominent position when the city was rebranding itself. But the result is a disaster. It pains my type designer soul. It wasn't supposed to be like this. It's the equivalent of taking a painting or a photo and then stretching it. It's really distorted. Not everyone was thrilled to see a foreigner coming along and getting this job. 
In the Arab world, the main hubs of typeface design are Beirut and Cairo. Amman is a very young city, it's only a hundred years old, and the field just doesn't exist here. Anyway, designing the font was my own idea. To me, this is a lovely use of Amman type, in Arabic and Latin script, in bold. The rough edges I built into the design were inspired by a certain atmosphere in the city. It has a kind of rawness, a lack of polish that I wanted the font to express. Lots of people here do apparently agree that the font captures the mood of their city. The Bauhaus Code, a philosophy developed at a small German art school and adopted across the world. A manual for structuring daily life based on principles of architecture and design. An interdisciplinary school with radical new teaching methods that fostered freedom and experimentation. A school that pioneered the fusion of fine art and craft. After years of extraordinary creativity, the Bauhaus had moved to Berlin and was forced to close down under pressure from the Nazis. 1933 was the end of the road. The Bauhaus was founded in Weimar as a state-subsidized school. That's why it was called the Weimar State Bauhaus. In Dessau, it was a municipal institution. And in Berlin, it was a private institution, financed primarily out of Mies van der Rohe's own pocket. Although forced to close, its breakup helped it evolve into a global movement. From the outset, the Bauhaus was very international. Thanks to its international connections, it wasn't all that hard for the Bauhausers to disperse around the world after the school's closure. The Bauhaus movement also left its mark in Tel Aviv. Between 1920 and 1940, some 4,000 buildings built in the modern style were erected in the city centre. In 2003, the White City was made a UNESCO World Cultural Heritage Site. The White City was largely the work of architects who had studied with Walter Gropius, Mies van der Rohe and other European architects. In the 1930s, many Jews fled growing anti-Semitism in Europe and emigrated to Palestine. There, they contributed to the making of a new society. These days, many of the buildings have fallen into disrepair. The paint is peeling and the facades crumbling. However, the UNESCO World Cultural Heritage status has helped raise awareness of these buildings' historic value. The Max Liebling House, built in 1936, is undergoing an extensive restoration and will soon be opening as a heritage center. Israeli-German architect Sharon golan Yaron is program director of the White City Center. She's well aware what a treasure it is. Let's see what original features from Germany we have here. Look at this. This is a handle. When we dismantled the door handles and cleaned them up, we saw that they had stamps from the company WEHAG. You can just about see it. We did some research and found out that they really were made by the company that manufactured the Gropius handles, so for the Bauhaus. The company was called Loewy. There are all sorts of treasures like that here. Mehr. 
It's interesting in architecture how many German words Hebrew uses. We say Kant for Kante or edge. Sockel for sockel or base. Kratzputz and Steinputz, scratch coat, stone plaster. We say schlicht, the German word for plain. It's funny listening to Jewish and Arab construction workers on the building side. They're like, hey, Moshe, Kratzputz. It goes to show how much expertise was brought here in the 1930s. Not just materials, but skills. Sharon is meeting up with Schula Wiedrich, who gives tours of the White City. She's an expert on the architects who gave Tel Aviv its distinctive look. Gropius, you said. Gropius, a binyan pestle. And Gropius says that the building is a statue that people walk in. And Mayer said that aesthetic is not important. Yes. And yes, and she says that Mayer says that aesthetics are not so important, but uh, we have to fix the social uh, behavior of the, uh, of the population. Hannes Meyer, Gropius's successor, fervently believed in design for the people. What became of that goal? Is Bauhaus design as functional as it set out to be? Is Bauhaus nowadays just a brand? Find out in the second episode of our series, Bauhaus World, The Effect.